Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Phil. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 20. Sure is good to see Sister Tina this morning. That's a blessing. God bless you, Sister. 2 Kings. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter number 20. Let's begin reading in verse number 1. I want to uh, talk to you this morning about the truth that prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. We're going to have a week of prayer here at the church. Uh, we're right around the corner. We've announced it in the bulletin. We've been asking you to pray. And I think one of the reasons that we're not seeing uh, great answers is because we've somehow been convinced by the enemy that prayer really doesn't change anything. Uh, some have even taught in the church that the only thing prayer really changes is changes your attitude, your mindset. It kind of resigns you to God's will. Well, when you look at the Bible, you see that's not the case at all that uh, God delights in our coming to Him and dealing with Him and calling upon Him. And uh, it's, a, it's one of those things that's difficult for us to comprehend because we know that God's eternal. We know that God is all-knowing. There's nothing God does not know. And yet when we deal, when God deals with us in His Word, it's, He's dealing with us in time, in the immediate situ circumstance and situation. And in that time, in God's dealing with us, there's an ebb and flow. There's a yes and no. There's a working out of your relationship with God in time. And you see that all throughout the Scriptures. And so I hope that you will uh, heed the admonition of God's Word this morning. Let's look at 2 Kings chapter 20, and you'll see it clearly taught in this passage of Scripture. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned, that is, Hezekiah, his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with the perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out of the middle court, that is, before he had gotten too far from Hezekiah, he hadn't gone very far at all, hadn't even passed the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee, on the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs, and they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, The sign shalt thou have of the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that thou hast spoken. Do the thing that he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or go back ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward ten degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward by which he had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. In other words, it's a sundial. And Hezekiah said, well, it wouldn't be much if it just moved forward. Uh, but if you would 
move the sundial backwards 10 degrees, that would be a miraculous thing. And so God moved time, as it were, backwards, or the sundial backwards as they looked at it, and Hezekiah was confirmed, uh, the word of the Lord was confirmed in Hezekiah by God moving back the sundial 10 degrees. Let's have prayer. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come together before you in your name and, Lord, to worship you. We ask, God, for your grace this morning. We pray for help. We ask for favor. Lord, you have power over all flesh. You know every heart, every person that's in this service. Lord, you know their needs. You know the saved and the unsaved. Lord, you know the Bible makes it clear you know them that are yours, that belong to you. And God, those that belong to Satan, we ask God that you would open up the blinded eyes of those that are uh, belonging to the evil one and let the light of the gospel shine into their heart this morning. Help them to understand the gospel. Help them to embrace Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But also, Father, help us as your children. Help us to realize that you delight in answering prayer. Lord, what a great uh, demonstration of your power, this answered prayer. And God, I pray that you would help us to be convinced by your word that prayer truly changes things. And Lord, you want to change our world. You want to change our heart. You want to change our lives. And Lord, what's lacking is our prayer. And so, Lord, convince us, convict us, draw us to a, the conclusion that we're, we're going to be before you, Father, asking for those things that we need uh, so that you might be glorified in answered prayer. Lord, help us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some great <clears throat> mysteries about the topic of prayer. Prayer really is simple. It's so simple that anyone can pray. It's not hard or difficult for us to be able to pray. A little child can pray. How many of you have delighted in hearing the prayer of a little child? Uh, maybe a bedtime prayer or mealtime prayer. Uh, but even children can pray. I remember when my oldest daughter, Vicki, was only four years old, we had a man attending our church that was unsaved. And we had witnessed to Mr. Roger and tried to uh, tell him the gospel and, and he had become somewhat of a friend of the family and, and yet he wouldn't come to Christ. He would not accept the Lord. And so every Sunday night, Vicky would come to the altar, kneel in the altar at the age of four. And when I finished preaching, I would give him the altar near my daughter and I would say, Vicky, why did you come uh, this evening? And she said... Daddy, I want to see Mr. Rogers saved. And so nearly every Sunday night for a long uh, period of time, I knelt in the altar with my four-year-old and prayed that Mr. Rogers would come to Christ. wasn't long after that we had a visiting preacher. And he preached the sermon and Mr. Rogers fell under conviction. And then while we were trying to get some things together for uh, fellowship uh, out in our fellowship area, uh, Mr. Roger and the visiting preacher uh, knelt in the altar and Roger came to faith in Christ and the Lord radically changed his life and his heart because of the prayer of a four-year-old. God can hear the prayers of children. You don't have to be a great person, a mighty person. You can be a, a someone that no one knows in the world at all but the most wonderful thing about that is that if you are that unknown person, God knows who you are and God receives your request and God can answer your prayers. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Little children can pray. The mentally disabled can pray. The geniuses can pray. I've never met too many of them. But my wife's one because she married me, but geniuses can pray. Uh, healthy people, the unhealthy people can pray, the young can pray, the old can pray. No matter who you are, everybody, anybody, all people, everywhere uh, can pray. And yet there's some still some mysterious things about it. Isn't that true? A four-year-old can have faith and trust God that he's going to save uh, uh, the unsaved man and it's wonderful when God does those things, but if you've ever attempted to really pray and grow 
in your understanding of prayer, you know there's an aspect of prayer that's even mysterious. It's uh, unknowable. It's hard to grasp. It's hard to understand. Some of you may have known people in your life that were known as people of prayer. Uh, There's a man in history, the church history, no one hardly even knows his first name. Uh, He's not called by his first name, he's just called Praying Hyde. He was a missionary to India. And I wondered often, what was his name? And so I tried to find out his name, and finally I got a, a book about him. His name was John, John Hyde, but people didn't refer to him as uh, Mr. John, or uh, John A. referred to him often as Praying Hyde because he was known as a man of prayer and he experienced some of those deep mysteries of prayer. How that God does answer prayer sometimes to us is mysterious because in one case God might immediately heal this sick one who is struggling with sickness and then at other times God may not heal this individual and so it's mysterious sometimes in why this answer and not that answer. Have you ever wrestled with that yourself? Uh, One of the well-known men of prayer was E.M. Bounds and E.M. Bounds said this, prayer is the easiest and hardest of all things. I would say amen to that. (laughs) Prayer is the easiest and hardest of all things. It is the simplest and most sublime, the weakest and the most powerful. The results lay outside the range of human possibilities. They are limited only by the omnipotence of God. In the section of Scripture before us, we learn, I think, an important lesson. I think a lesson that we, we would do well to spend much time on if we would kind of remember what the Bible teaches about prayer would help us, I think, have the confidence that we need in prayer. And I I think if there's one thing that's missing when we pray is that confidence that God has really heard our prayers and that we're going to receive an answer to our prayers. And the reason that is so essential when it comes to prayer is because if there's not an expectation of an answer... Please hear me. If there's not an expectation of an answer, the answer certainly will not come. Do you understand that? If there's not an expectation of an answer, there's not the faith that God is going to answer, then the lack of faith guarantees that there will be no answer coming from our Heavenly Father. So we need to go back to the Bible and strengthen our faith and confidence when it comes to the subject of prayer and know that our God does delight in answering prayer and the reality that prayer, like in Hezekiah's life, really changes things. First of all, I want you to notice the announcement. In 2 Kings chapter number 20 and verse 1, the announcement is really clear. The prophet Isaiah says, to Hezekiah the king, thou shalt die and not live. I mean, I don't think that you could have any uh, plainer statement, right? It can't get any more straightforward. uh, There's no doubt about what Isaiah is trying to get across. Uh, This is a direct, definite statement about the condition that Hezekiah is in and he is going to die. Notice the source of this announcement. It wasn't an enemy that was mocking uh, Hezekiah and trying to get him to just believe a lie. It wasn't some seducer, some enemy. It was the prophet of God. It was a well-known prophet of God. It was an honorable prophet of God. Isaiah was not a false prophet. He did not announce false Uh, things. He didn't say untrue things. So the source of this announcement is, in fact, God himself. God is the one that said to Isaiah, Isaiah, I want you to go and tell Hezekiah he is going to die and he will not live. Did you notice that? You're going to die and you will not live. Just so you missed, if you didn't get the first part, 
I want you to understand the second part. The source is God. You know, God has made that announcement for every single one of us, but we don't seem to respond like Hezekiah, do we? Isn't that true? That in Hebrews chapter 9, God says plainly, it's what appointed unto men to die, and after this the judgment Every single one of us knows that we're not going to live here on this earth forever. Right? That our time down here is short. It's limited. We don't have a long period of time to live on planet earth. And then when we're finished here, we go to our eternal abode. It's once appointed unto man to die and after this, the judgment. The reason that's important is if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you need to be as earnest in prayer as Hezekiah was asking for his healing, physical healing. You need to be as earnest in prayer asking God for salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And as God heard Hezekiah's prayer, God will also hear your prayer and He will save you. It's once appointed unto man to die, and after this, the judgment. God's the one that decreed this. I don't know if I'm getting it across to you, but like I, I need to, but here is an announcement that comes not from the doctor. Sometimes doctors say, well, I've got bad news. It comes from deity. It comes from the one who never makes a mistake. This decree is from the Almighty God. It seems to be an unchangeable decree, right? I mean, how dare when God says something, we say, wait a minute, God. Let's talk about that for a little bit, right? Most of the time we say, well, God, that's what you said. That has to be the end of the discussion. There's no room for discussion here. The certainty of the announcement. God is stating this in words. It is a fixed, there's no reason even come to me, Hezekiah, with any prayer whatsoever. I think so often we face things in life and it's just like this. Don't you? Think about someone who is un a loved one who is unsaved. Some of us think about there's just nothing we can do about that. It means lost. That's the condition. That's the end of the story. Many times when it comes to our own physical issues, I think sometimes God would be d delighted to heal our physical bodies. I think God would be glorified sometimes in healing our physical bodies. But sometimes, especially in our day, as soon as we face a physical matter, we're almost convinced by what everyone says that that's the end of it. There's no reason to pray for healing now. Do you face that in our day? Listen to me. I know that there's a charismatic thought that's going on that's really dangerous that God always wants to hear every, heal everybody that's not the truth and the Bible doesn't bear that out to be true if the Bible bore that out to be true I would tell you this morning God wants to always heal everybody if that were the case there would be no funeral homes right <laughs> if you always he healed everybody nobody would ever die isn't that true but it's not God's will to always heal everybody. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We're not really sure what that thorn in the flesh was, but he prayed three times. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians that we have ever known, the church has ever known, prayed three times, God, remove this thorn. Take it away. And God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. It's necessary in your life. It's there for a purpose. So I'm not going to remove it. So God doesn't always heal, but listen to me, I think sometimes because that He doesn't always heal, we sometimes convince ourselves that He never heals. How many would say amen to that? And so many times we hear of some awful physical malady, and instead of us coming to the Lord and praying about it, we almost just resign to that's what's been decreed and there's nothing that we can do about it whatsoever. And I'm here to tell you, prayer 
changes things. It may be God's will to he completely heal your body. I also wanted to point out the sympathy in the announcement. God did say to Hezekiah, set thine house in order. In other words, the sympathy was, Hezekiah, it's not going to be immediate. You're going to have some time here, a little bit of time, so you can get things in order in your home. And I love how Hezekiah used that space of time. He used that for prayer. Amen? I said, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to get some things right. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and began to pray the announcement. In other words, God has said it. It seems to be, a, 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 you can't even refute this. It's a settled thing. Don't worry about praying about this whatsoever. But then notice the agony. Listen to what Hezekiah does in verse number 2. Then turned he his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, most of the uh, prayers recorded in the Bible are not chapters. Right? <laughs> They're not lengthy prayers. Most of the prayers recorded in the Bible are not books. Most of them are really short prayers that address the immediate issue and many of them are prayers of desperation out of hearts that are broken about a need and listen often when, it, when it's that kind of atmosphere in prayer you see God changing things notice Hezekiah's diligence immediately Hezekiah seeks the Lord in prayer I think so often we don't get answers to our prayers like we would love to get answers to our prayer because we're not as diligent about that as Hezekiah was now, I know this is a major issue. I know this is a life or death issue, but it's amazing that sometimes even in those heavy moments of life, the first thing we think of is not prayer. Is that true? How I many of you would say, I'm guilty of that sometimes? I don't think the first thing I need to do is get on my face and cry out to God when I hear news like this. You might think, well, maybe I need to get a second opinion. <laughs> Right? Or when the, m many things that we do when we hear terrible things like Hezekiah heard, but often the last thing should be the first thing. Hezekiah knew the only place to go was God. And I'm telling you, often in your life, you're going to come to times in your life that that's going to be your only place to go likewise. <laughs> I wish young people would learn that quicker than what we learn it. When you're young, there, there seems to be a little lack of this desperation in prayer. You're healthy, things seem to be going well, but life down the road, you're going to learn there's some things that will drive even you to your knees in just a moment. My wife can tell you the, my exact age when, when I had the accident, 27. I was only 27 years old. My life was radically changed. That's young. I was working late at night and uh, finished up one of our last jobs and I was driving back and a young lady run a stop sign at night. Our lights were on, her lights were on. I don't know why in the world she ran the stop sign that she did and hit me in uh, my truck and my truck flipped three or four times and hit a large oak tree and I was thrown out of the truck and was laying on the side of the road with a broken leg almost at my hip, my right femur, and broken back, L3, 4, and 5. And L4 was a burst fracture which meant that it had just disintegrated. And at the age of 27, on the side of the road... There was really only one person I could go to, and that was God. Amen. And guess what? Before anybody, and, and as soon as people heard about what the need was, they called the house and they said to Brenda, Why is Tommy's tools all over the road? <laughs> She's like, What? What do you mean his tools are? So she started calling from different hospitals. Is my husband there? Is my husband there? And finally, when they learned that it had been a terrible automobile accident, 
people started praying all over the country, but before the first person offered up the first prayer, God had already helped us. It was a bad accident, severe accident, but God had already helped us during that time. In other words, my spinal cord was injured, and they said if it had been injured much more, it would have severed my spinal cord, and I would have never stood on my own two feet again. I've been in a wheelchair the rest of my life. And so before the first prayer was offered up, God said, Tommy, I'm going to take you this far, but I'm not going to take you that far because I don't know if you can handle that. <laughs> but I was young, and I had to face that. And you may be young and have to face the loss of a mother or father or, or some uh, disease sometimes afflict young people. It's, you're healthy now, everything's fine now, but if you don't learn to come to God now with your burdens, you're not going to go to, to Him immediately when it's really important that you go to Him. And by the way, there's going to come a time in your life, every one of us, that we're going to go to God. Now, you used to say there was no... Uh, atheist in foxholes right and the atheists don't like that too much but the truth is when the bombs start bursting close around you how much how many of you want to kind of bet that they say God help us amen isn't that true and I'm just saying by this you need to learn to come to God with great needs and know that no matter what the news is God is able to change it We see his desperation in prayer. The Bible mentions this several times. He turned his face to the wall and he prayed. Notice what it says in verse number 5. Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain, my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. Notice, I have seen thy tears, and behold, I will heal thee. You see what I'm saying to you? Prayer changes things but sometimes there's not that earnestness in prayer there's not that desperation in prayer there's not the I must get an answer sometimes when we pray the honest truth is it's almost like we threw it up in the air and we just don't even know if it's going to fall back to the ground or if it just it's just oh well have you ever prayed that way how many of you ever prayed that way about be honest now Sometimes you prayed about stuff and really you didn't expect there was to, to be an answer to anything. And that's a poor habit to develop when it comes to your prayer life. If you pray about anything, there needs to be a, the habit, the habitual act of expecting some kind of answer, even if it's the answer of no from God, you know that it was a no from Him. It just wasn't an unanswered prayer. There needs to be an expectation when you pray. And there needs to be a desperation in your prayers. Someone said what's missing in prayer is the O. Oh God! You see, we lack that in our day. And listen to me, I want to say this to us and to me. I'm talking to myself again this morning also. If America ever needed some people to cry out, Oh God! It's in our day. I mean, how many of you would have thought that we, have, we would have gone as far as we have gone as a nation in the last, what, 10 to 12 years? I mean, we have embraced things in America that God has said clearly is an abomination, homosexual marriage, and things like that, but that's just the tip of the iceberg when you look at the political realm today, there, there's, a, there's a lack of honesty, it seems like, in every individual in higher office. And I don't know how far the corruption goes, right? And it's not just the D's or the R's. It seems like it's just in politics everywhere. It's, a, it's I'll do something for you if you do something for me. And we don't really care what happens to America, Right? There needs to be some desperation in our prayers, some earnestness in our prayers. Remember when Hannah prayed. Hannah was without a child and she wanted a child and so she got into the altar and she was... 
And the priest looked over there and he said, what in the world is wrong with her? She must have been drinking. She's drunken. That's her problem. She's a drunkard. And he goes to the altar to rebuke her. Don't come to this altar and pray while you've been drinking. She said, I'm not drinking. I have a need and I need God's help. And he said to her, thy prayer has been answered. You're going to have a child. By this time next year, you'll have a little baby boy in your hands. You see, I'm, I'm telling you, there's some things that we need to really engage God with, and, and, and it's almost the Jacob in the temple, right? You know what I'm talking about? Jacob had separated himself, and God comes to deal with Jacob, and it's an all-night wrestling section, and God's trying to pin Jacob, and Jacob's saying, no, I, I don't want to submit, I don't want to surrender, and God puts his arms down again, and uh, if John was here this morning, he liked this, it was like a WWE, right? At the count of three, he split his shoulder up again, and he wrestled all night long, and all night long, until the breaking of the day. And then God wounds the man, the man finally yields to God's will for his life after the wounding. But we need to get along with God sometimes ourselves and say, Lord, I cannot leave until I get a definite answer. How many of you, I don't know if you've experienced this before, some of you have kind of known this and then you go to pray. Have you ever experienced this? And that's the most difficult time you've ever prayed in your entire life, Right? The phone rings. Strangers come over to the house. Somebody gets sick. Someone calls, hey, there's somebody in the hospital. It's an emergency. And it seems like the whole world fights you getting along with God and getting a definite answer from God. How many would say amen to that? Prayer changes things. Satan knows that. And that's why he does everything he can to discourage prayer. But notice the answer Notice again, turn again, verse 5, Tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. Verse 6, And I will add unto thee thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Amen? So what I'm trying to get you to see is even though God is the one that initially said you are going to die because Hezekiah came before the Lord and prayed earnestly, God said, Hezekiah, I'm going to change that decree. Has God ever done that before in the Bible? Yes, He has. Remember in Exodus chapter 32, 33 when the children of Israel had forsaken immediately their blood covenant agreement with God that we'd have no other idols and no other gods and Moses had gone back up on the mountain to get instruction on how to build the tabernacle and they come to Aaron and they say Aaron up and make us gods make us some idols and images that show us what God might look like the God that led us out from Egyptian bondage and Aaron said break off your golden earrings and bring me your jewelry and he made a golden calf. And the people of Israel, the Bible discreetly says, they rose up to play. And that doesn't mean that they've got uh, baseball gloves on and they're throwing balls around. It means that they are committing gross, immoral, sexual sins. There's loud music, there's, there's a party-like atmosphere so much that Joshua says it's the sound of battle. And he says, no, it's not battle. And it wasn't battle at all. It was the worship of a false god and they were doing immoral things. And I can't even tell you exactly what they were doing. It was so disgraceful. And God saw it and He said, Moses, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth and I'll start over with you. And the Bible said that the anger of the Lord was kindled and that it waxed hot. That's it. I'm done with them. I'm through. I'm going to destroy every single one of them. And Moses fell on his knees. 
And he said, God, please don't do that. And he, he interceded. He said, God, don't do that. Don't destroy the people. Have mercy on the people. If you destroy them, everybody will think that you only rescued them to bring them out in the wilderness and destroy them. It's going to make you look bad. God, have mercy. And God said, all right. I won't destroy them in answer to your prayers. You come across a strange phrase in the Bible. Strange because the Lord changes not. Malachi 3.6 Behold, I the Lord, I change not. Now please don't misunderstand that verse. That means His character never changes. Who He is cannot change. His standards of right and wrong never change. In other words, He's not going to evolve in His thinking about marriage just because we are corrupt in our thinking we're not going to corrupt his mind and get him to change his opinion about marriage. He does not change his mind about morality, things that are right and things that are wrong. But God's will does change as he's working out a relationship with you and I and how we respond to what God is doing. Sometimes God will change things because of our intercessory prayer or our prayers of desperation. He will. And he's done that over and over again in the Bible. Remember, Joshua's in battle and they're about to defeat the enemy. And they need just a little bit more time. And, and it, it's not that Joshua addresses Yahweh and says, Yahweh, please stop the sun and the moon. But just out of a directed prayer to God, a desperate prayer, God give us more time. God does that. God extends the day. You know what's strange about this? Scientists argue, well, if that happens, the sun can't stand still, the moon can't stand still. All God is saying in that passage is that he, he made the day light last longer that day. That wouldn't be no difficulty for God whatsoever. Amen? You don't have to recreate the universe to make the day like last longer. Amen? And God gave Israel victory. Did things change when Joshua cried out in prayer? Absolutely. For three and a half years it did not rain. Elijah cried out to God and said, God, don't let it rain because our sins are t so terrible. God, do not let it rain. So for three and a half years it didn't rain. And then... Elijah gets on his knees again. And he said, God, send the rain. And after three and a half years, and not one raindrop, no dew on the earth, after three and a half years, the rain came. And the rain came in answer to prayer. And on and on in the Bible, you see where God has done something. And then that little word repented. It repented the Lord that He had made man. It doesn't mean that God had to... Uh, a repent of some evil that he had done or some wrongdoing. It doesn't mean that all. It just means this. He changed his mind. He said, how can an all-knowing God change his mind? How can the all-knowing God change things? He does that because of his relationship with man. And if he doesn't let those passages stand in the Bible as they are for our instruction, you know what we would do? We would come to statements that doctors make or to just lies from the devil, and we can say, well, nothing's ever going to change. Wouldn't that be true? If God has never demonstrated His Word that He changes, that things can change, we would never go to Him in faith believing that prayer changes things. That's why we have evidence over and over again in the Bible that God does change things in answer to prayer. His character never changes. He does not change, but His mind is changed by prayer. Are you with me on that? I, I, now listen, that's not... The Bible is filled with examples of that. Remember Matthew? I'll give you this last one, Matthew chapter 15. A woman comes to Jesus out of desperation. He has a daughter, and that daughter is possessed with a demon. 
And she's trying to get to Jesus, but she's a Gentile. She's not of the nation of Israel. And so she tries to talk to the disciples, and the disciples said, get out of here. The master doesn't have any time for you whatsoever. And she said, I can't leave until I talk to him. They said, man, you're going to have to leave. I can't leave until I talk to him. Man, you're going to have to leave. I can't leave. And they go to Jesus. And Jesus, she just is bothering us. And he makes a comment to them so she can hear it, not to her. I cannot give bread to dogs. The bread for the children of Israel is not going to be given to Gentiles. And you know what she does when she hears that? She sees her opening, her opportunity. The Lord has at least acknowledged her presence. And she runs and bows before him and she says, Yes, Lord, that's true, Lord, that's true. I'll accept a dog position. I'll accept any position. But I'm telling you, I need a crumb. You don't even have to give me the full loaf of bread. If you'll just give me a crumb and you'll heal my daughter... I'll be satisfied with the crumbs that fall from your table. And Jesus looks at her and he says, Woman, great is thy faith. You have so great faith. I haven't even seen this kind of faith in the nation of Israel. You have an amazing faith. Everybody else would have quit by now. Everybody else would have stopped praying. Everybody else would have walked away. Some would have got angry when they heard the word dog. And they would have stormed out. But you didn't do that. You came with humility and persistency and you cried out and you got an answer to prayer. Prayer changes things. She went home to her daughter that had been made whole. If God hadn't given us those examples, we would quit praying. We would come short. We would never get great answers. God has given you this here. and this, this is for you. This is for us. So we would know that there's a God in heaven that can even change death sentences. There's a God in heaven that's not limited in His power to do amazing things. Now will He always do this or that for us? I, can't, I know that He can give us an impression that says yes or no. Amen? But I know he has opened himself up to at least the possibility that he will. Amen? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing he'll change for, for certain. If you're here this morning and you're lost and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you'll come and kneel on this altar and accept Jesus, you'll leave here a changed person. You'll leave here a different person. Because God will hear that prayer and he will change your life and change your heart. Amen? He will. And say, person, are you struggling? Do you need an answer from prayer? Why don't you come and say, God, help me. Help me to be like that woman that kept coming even though there was so much discouragement because I need to hear from heaven. I've got to get an answer. Will you do that as we come for prayer? Will you stand? Let's pray.